Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Greetings. Welcome to uh, the fifth lecture in the series um, of Images, Imaginations and Cultures. This lecture is titled Imagining and Imaging and Imagining the Other. So in this lecture, I will um, primarily adopt a post-colonial lens to look at the creation of the other, quote unquote other, and how um, the purpose of image and the sense of imagining that when behind um, creation of that image or such images um, went uh, into creating the other. So I'll start with a powerful um, quote uh, from Michel Montaigne's um, work which says the history of the European view of non-European peoples has always reflected Europeans history of imagining themselves. Now there is a lot of dynamic, a lot of dynamism that's going on um, in this quote that you see on the screen. So what it is referring to is that the creation of the other um, has a long, a prolonged history with the history of colonialism, with the history of the European view of non-European peoples. And in a way of creating that historical sense of quote unquote other, um, it has also in a way reflected Europeans history of imagining themselves. So the idea here is that um, the sense of um, you know, Europe's general knowledge of Africa, and this is in the context of Africa that uh, the author is talking about, um, before the 19th century um, was really, uh, you know, a story of armchair uh, geographers, armchair anthropologists who possibly would not venture out into the field and, you know, they would imagine um, the other, imagine the exotic, imagine people who uh, they would think that, you know, would not be like them. and. You know, this imagination comes from, a, you know, a rather shallow set of archives, um, you know, shallow set of reports, um, and also, you know, uh, stories that, that accumulated over past centuries, uh, you know, and, and which give rise to the sense of quote unquote Africa as the Europeans believed in, um, you know, the idea of that Africa becomes then, um, you know, fabricated, that idea of the other becomes fabricated. And it was much, uh, you know, driven by the Western demands and prejudices of creating the other. And, you know, what resulted in this process is that, um, you know, a sense of image, a sense of imagery followed an image of Africa, an image of, uh, uh, you know, uh, the one who should be ruled. And in fact, you know, such powerful is that image uh, that was imagined from, um, you know, various, uh, you know, shallow sources that, you know, some of these images and imaginings, you know, you know, are there even today, it survives even today. And this sort of parallels with another concept that I will be talking about in this lecture today, um, you know, Edward Said's idea of Orientalism, Edward Said's idea of discursive Orient. So um, in, the, in, the, uh, in lecture two, we have seen um, the idea of discourse, the idea of language creating or imagining uh, visual cultures. And here I will invest a little more to talk about, uh, you know, this discursive creation of the Orient, the discursive creation of the other, um, as we find in the accounts of uh, Edward Said's, um, 
you know, work Orientalism and, you know, much of this idea of Orient being constructed by, uh, you know, the, the European travelers um, in an effort also to imagine themselves. So the idea of the other, when, when I place the concept of the idea of the other um, in front of you, um, I'm also talking about a very clear boundary work here. And this is a conceptual framework we have seen in the first lecture. But I think this is um, you know, a moment that we need to revisit this conceptual framework. And um, you know, we need to understand what sort of a boundary work is being carried on here um, in order to create the other and how, how the other is imagined in, um, in various forms of expression, such as images. So let me recap for you what uh, the idea of boundaries and boundary work entailed, um, that it's primarily arising out of um, race and ethnicity studies. If you're familiar with that domain of um, academic scholarship, you would know um, the idea of race um, being contested, uh, the idea of the race, uh, you know, being, um, you know, that socially constructed. Um, and then uh, we do see that uh, the ideas of boundary, that, you know, we need binaries, we need to establish a boundary between us and others, us and them, um, you know, primarily comes from that body of scholarship primarily comes from race and ethnicity studies. Um, and increasingly, because this conceptual framework is so helpful to understand um, this creation of the other, this creation of binaries um, in human categories, um, that it has found um, you know, a lot of relevance in, in, in any sort of uh, human behavior in motion, for example, migration studies, assimilation studies, acculturation studies. Um, and we do see that uh, the emphasis on the boundaries, you know, um, have been important and have been significant because it is their persistence through praxis that, you know, we do see that boundaries are enforced, boundaries are enacted through praxis-based um, work. That is the work of setting and maintaining boundaries and even of transgressing, that we do see that, um, you know, we are talking about uh, a boundary work, a process of boundary work that has not just, you know, ensured creation of us and others, uh, you know, creation of binaries, but has also ensured the continuation of social divisions. And as human beings, if you are familiar with the history of, um, you know, the growth of anthropology, uh, growth of uh, sociology, you would say that as, um, you know, human beings, uh, you know, one of um, our tendencies as a group of human beings um, is to believe in categories, is to believe in um, compartmentalization. And, you know, uh, that is what the human brain also believes in, that, um, you know, we believe in categories. So. You know, when we when we look at this binary sort of an operation, um, you know, it, it's it sort of uh, you know becomes for the for the common people, um, you know, more acceptable in in forms of creation of a category. For example, um, you know, um, if you look at uh, the birth of uh, gender studies, for example, um, you know, the categories that uh, we have been attaching with gender um, previously, uh, male or female, um, is the human brain which is trying to categorize them into boxes that, you know, either male or female. But we know, I mean, those of who are, you know, work in the field of gender studies, um, we know how problematic, you know, such a boundary, such a binary classification can be. And so, you know, of course, gender studies have evolved uh, beyond the male and the female, but then, um, you know, the, the, the very fact that we believe in social categories um, is also ensuring uh, sort of, you know, um, the evolution and the continuation of social division. So boundary work, coming back to boundary work, you know, it is a, you know, helpful conceptual framework that helps us um, to 
understand that helps us to critically reflect on how the images um, of the other, how the images of the Orient, for example, in this case, um, have been created, or for example, how the images of the quote unquote savage, for example, um, you know, were created and then enforced and continued. So, uh, staying on with the idea of boundary work, uh, we have also seen that we are talking about symbolic and social boundaries and um, you know symbolic boundaries are more important in this case uh, uh, than social boundaries um, and you know symbolic boundaries are conceptual distinctions um, made by actors to categorize objects, people, practices and even time and space. And um, social boundaries are objectified forms of social differences manifested in unequal access to an unequal distribution of resources, material and non-material and social opportunities. So, we do see that uh, the function of boundaries, whether they are social, whether they are symbolic, um, has to do with the purpose of, uh, you know, working towards creating another. Um, so, before I go into uh, more details about uh, the, um, the idea of Orientalism, let me quickly revisit for you the idea of, um, you know, culture and, um, you know, some key concepts that culture puts forward um, for our understanding of the other. So, the first idea that we would be dealing with here is the idea of culture as signifying practices. And um, we, we know that culture oftentimes is a social construct, right? So, culture is not static, it is dynamic, it evolves with the people who form the culture. Um, and culture is also oftentimes uh, what we believe to be normal, you know, quote unquote normal, that, you know, what is normal, we believe that, you know, oh, this is, this is culture. Um, but, um, you know, that normal, the idea of normal is of course, um, you know, very variant in, in con contexts of cultural, um, you know, cultural practices throughout the globe. So, in other words, culture is not static, it is not absolute. And, uh, you know, there are reasons, there are forces that make culture dynamic, that make culture change. Um, and these are oftentimes uh, referred to as power relations in society. We have talked about um, power relations in my previous uh, lectures also. Um, and then, um, you know, another idea with culture is that uh, culture is also learned. So, uh, you know, when we are born and we grow up, we look around, we look at, you know, look at our parents, look at our family, look at society around us, we learn culture. And so, this element of culture is learned, um, you know, is also going a long way to capture this binary of the other. So, you know, while growing up, you know, if you're looking at around you, uh, you know, a cultural practice that believes in a binary, that believes in either or, that believes in black or white, um, you know, that sort of um, a training would get into um, you as a cultural uh, people and then, you know, you would be growing up learning that culture. So, culture has been a signifying practice behind, um, you know, this, this creation of uh, the other. The second one, which is uh, representation, um, which looks at how the world is socially constructed and represented too and by us in meaningful ways is also an important indicator um, of how we understand the, uh, the other uh, is being constructed. Um, I will talk about representation a little more in, in the next uh, slides, but going on to the third um, uh, attribute, the concept of culture, um, the idea of materialism, that uh, has its uh, relevance with creation um, of the other, um, mostly as the consequences uh, of patterns of ownership, control of contours of cultural landscapes. 
And finally, um, the idea of non-reductionism, which is uh, referring to the political economy, social relationships and culture that must be understood in terms of their own specific logics and modes of development. And so non-reductionism actually uh, deals with questions of class, gender, sexuality, race, ethnicity, nation, age, um, religion, etc. So, um, you know, in this lecture, I'm going to deal um, a little more um, with the issues of representation, with the issues of non-reductionism. And so, I'm going to look at these uh, questions of, um, you know, social divisions, questions of social boundary work, um, you know, particularly around questions of uh, the colonial order of, um, you know, class, gender, sexuality, race, and nation. So, uh, moving on to the idea of uh, colonial knowledge uh, of the other. And uh, here in this case, I'm particularly going to talk about the case of uh, Edward Said and his idea of Orientalism. So if you are familiar with Edward Said's um, work, uh, he's a scholar in the humanities. Um, and he was, uh, you know, whose entire education was Western. He grew up in Egypt, Palestine, and um, he wrote uh, his, you know, you know, quite significant, groundbreaking work um, on Orientalism. And Orientalism, uh, he wrote, Said wrote, uh, in a, with a purpose to advance our understanding of the way of cultural domination um, of oppressed people, uh, you know, the way that has operated over uh, the years, over the decades. And it comes with a value, Orientalism comes with a critical value that it offers insights about colonialism from the perspective of one who has been colonized. So, um, in other words, um, it is the flip side of, it is the opposite side of um, the quote that I started with um, in this lecture that, um, you know, that, the, that on one hand we have um, the colonial rulers, uh, Europeans, you know, creating an image of Africa, um, you know, through, uh, through a process of othering and in that process creating an imagination about themselves, about Europeans themselves. And here in Orientalism, in, through the concept of ori Orientalism, um, you know, Saeed is providing an insight about colonialism from the perspective of one who has been colonized. So, from the colonized um, people perspective, uh, we see um, the lens of Orientalism providing insight about the processes of colonialism and the processes of creating the other in the uh, event. So, um, and, and, you know, Orientalism has, uh, you know, um, formed the basis of many indigenous intellectual challenges um, to, uh, to cultural um, sort of colonialism. And, uh, you know, the, the, the power of um, Said's work, the power of Orientalism lies in the fact that the way he has conceptualized the process of othering, the way he has conceptualized how um, another a binary is created in the process of colonialism. Um, the Orient, the Occident, Orientalism, you know, this principle, this, this conceptualization process um, is actually extendable, is ex actually, you know, we can, we can extend this relationship um, to, uh, you know, other forms, other dynamics of indigenous people with colonizers elsewhere in the world. So, it becomes all the more important for us to understand, uh, you know, what are the principles, what are the vantage points from which, uh, you know, Said is talking about um, for the idea of Orientalism. So, if you are familiar with the uh, book and the cover um, of Orientalism, um, 
you you would see you would notice a snake charmer, um, and this is uh, uh, this is a painting in the late 1860s by Jerome, and um, it's an example of French Orientalist school of painting, which is used on the cover of Sides Orientalism. So what you notice is not just um, a painting. What you also notice is that you know there is a creation of the knowledge of the other, that there is a creation of the exotic. There is a mode of discourse that is operational in the image that you are looking at. That is, that is the cover of um, sides or um, uh, orientalism, that it is a mode of discourse for representing the other with supporting images, vocabulary, discourse, etc. So this is also, uh, you know, for us to step back a moment and imagine that, you know, when we talk of an image, and as I was talking in my um, lecture too, um, you know, about the development of visual cultures, that when we look at an image, um, you know, whatever that is a painting, a photograph, or whatever the form of that image is, um, we are not just looking at an image. The image has an agenda. And so does the spectator. So what is that dynamic that is playing out between the image and importance? And this is in context with creating the other, um, what uh, the image is portraying, um, is that it is also helping us create a mode of discourse. And that discourse is actually um, you know, shedding light on creating um, what we understand to be representing the other, representing um, you know, a population that does not resemble um, you know, us, so you know, us and others. So there is um, this, this binary distinction. So there are some key questions then in Orientalism, and this is what Said, uh, you know, uh, you know, leaves us with when we talk of, uh, you know, um, um, Orientalism, is that um, how did or how do different academic disciplines, um, you know, come to the surface of Orientalism's broadly imperialist view of the world. So um, the idea of Orientalism leaves us with these critical questions. Um, and then how uh, does Orientalism transmit or reproduce itself from one epoch to the other? Is the idea of um, you know, Orientalism translatable from one um, epoch to the other? And how does authority operate, what ideas it dignify as true, what perceptions and judgments does it produce, reproduce and transmit, who are the pioneers whose texts become authoritative and get cited frequently in academic literature, and how do colonizers' depiction of colonized society reflect the strong ideas, doctrines, and trends of the colonizer's own society. So. Uh, so Orientalism actually, you know, not just provides us with the, um, you know, foundational um, toolkit to understand the discursive creation of the other. Um, Orientalism also leaves us with these critical questions um, of, you know, how can one divide human reality um, into distinct categories, for example, we and they, us and others, um, and then, um, you know, actually take these categories forward. So these are all social constructions, these categories are social constructions, and, you know, and, it, and they are socially, um, you know, reproduced also, that, uh, you know, once we create a binary, once we create a we and they, or once we create a us and others, um, you know, you know, there's also an effort to maintain that boundary work, to maintain that boundary and the binary. And so that is important that how does one actually, how does a group, a society, a culture actually, um, you know, maintain the boundaries, maintain or take them forward or, um, you know, possibly transgress boundaries and what are the social consequences once boundaries are transgressed. So uh, with that, we also come to the question of um, a subject position in Orientalism. 
that um, we are looking at a mode of discourse for representing the other, um, which is, uh, you know, through images, through vocabulary, through discourse, um, that we are actually creating a sense of being um, that, you know, we, in, a, in a society that we live in, there is a sense of the other. Um, it is also uh, bringing us um, to the idea um, that it is a style of thought, that it is based on a distinction between East and West. Now, um, you know, when I say East and West, the first thing that comes to our mind is I'm talking about geographical East and geographical West. But, um, you know, Orientalism would say that, you know, it is beyond a geographical separation of East and West that it is a style of thought that we attach a set of meanings, a set of um, symbolic boundaries that we believe in, in creating the East and uh, the West, in creating the Orient and the Occident. So um, what has emerged over the decades, um, you know, in this practice, in believing in this style of thought, in believing in this discourse, um, is that a network um, a corpor of, of, you know, corporate institutions um, and various other networks um, with vested interests that we see, um, you know, congresses, universities, foreign service institutes. And of course, um, you know, the nature of these uh, networks are evolving with response to um, several of the boundary transgressions that we see around us. So, um, so to understand, um, you know, Orientalism from its subject position, what we need to understand is, um, you know, the mode of discourse, you know, the discursive creation of uh, the of the Orient, the discursive creation of the other um, through that um, you know image and vocabulary. So um, Orientalism also had um, a role in defining Europe, and this goes back to the first um, you know quote that I started this lecture with, is that. The idea of contrasting conceptions, the idea of this or that, the idea of we and they or we or they, the idea of us or others, you know, this idea of contrasting conceptions, you know, find, found expression through um, images, very powerful images, ideas that translated into images personality and experiences that in a way also translated into images and um, you know discourse so what has emerged from that practice what has emerged from that contrasting conceptions is um, an assumed form of a hierarchy of superiority and inferiority and you know as as you saw uh, in the uh, in the in the image of the book cover of Orientalism, the snake charmer, um, you know, to, to, um, to an academic mind, you know, the first thing that would come to, uh, to our mind is that we are looking at a contrasting idea of, uh, you know, uh, the, the idea of we and they, us and others, and also we are looking at an idea of the exotic, right? So we are also looking at an idea of superiority and inferiority. And this becomes hegemonic, um, this idea of hierarchy, assumed hierarchy um, becomes hegemonic that is dominant and accepted by consent as conventional wisdom or common sense in Europe. And it's coming from Gramsci's idea um, of hegemony. So, um, so the Orientalism, the idea of Orientalism had a distinct role to play. Um, as you will see in the images that Orientalism produced, um, the type of discourse that Orientalism produced, and you know the creation of the other um, in the process um, in in um, defining Europe. So, um, so when we say that uh, the colonized, um, the colonized uh, as objects to the colonizer because, you know, we are doing a boundary work here and, um, you know, we are 
we are looking at a, a set or group of people of cultural practice set of cultural practices that possibly will not be similar to um, what we believe in um, and uh, you know when I say we I just mean uh, for example sake of creating the boundary work so um, Saeed uh, and this is what he talks about in um, Orientalism um, so it talks about colonized people are something one judges as in a court of law, something one studies and depicts as in curriculum, something one disciplines as in a school or prison, something one illustrates as in a zoological manual. So go back to the quote again and read it again something one judges. So he's talking about colonized people as objects. Something one judges, something one studies and depicts, something one disciplines, and something one illustrates. So he's talking about objectification, you know, um, objects, you know, colonized people becoming, you know, translated into objects in their process of becoming the other. Now, you know, there's a lot of literature also on this. Um, you know, the, the you know it, it's um, uh, if you look at uh, the literature on violence, on gender and violence, for example, uh, you, you will look at that. Um, you know, the first stage of um, violence, the first stage for violence to be enacted or violence to take place is that um, you know the victim must be introduced, uh, must must be um, you know uh, turned into first into an object the victim must become the object uh, first and so the objectification of the victim um, you know is the first stage of uh, you know violence uh, as uh, many of the literature would talk about um, and here you know Said is sort of indicating similar idea that um, you know the idea of colonizing people uh, you know, the first step towards colonizing is to actually uh, reduce the colonized people uh, into objects. And this is how um, Saith talks about um, as uh, the idea of, um, you know, Orientalism, the idea of the colonized as an object of study stamped with an otherness. So once you are actually reducing, um, you know, the colonized into uh, an object, um, it becomes, uh, you know, easier to actually stamp with an idea of otherness, um, and this otherness also brings with it ideas of passiveness, non-participating, uh, you know, ideas, and uh, you know, non-active, non-autonomous, non-sovereign, you know, ideas of non-involvement in the process. Um, so, um, you know, in the end. Um, you know, you you are actually left with this discourse of the other. You're actually left with this discourse of uh, you know being an object that is being studied. So, so the Oriental, um, you know, in this case uh, becomes uh, contained and represented by dominant uh, by dominating frameworks. So. So um, the the discursive orientation, the birth of the um, you know colonized people as um, you know or a reduction of the colonized people into objects becomes um, important here in creating the other. And um, as I was saying, the object of the study then becomes you know otherness that you're not uh, resonating with uh, you know the other part of the binary non-autonomous, non-sovereign. So, um, you know, so, so these would, this would um, be attributing to the idea of creating the other. So, um, we do see that uh, the creation of the other, the creation of, um, um, of uh, the other in images, um, also found uh, expression in other forms of um, uh, writings or texts, um, especially how they present colonized societies to their readers. And some of these examples include uh, political tracts, 
journalistic stories, travel books, religious books, scholarly work, poetry, novel. And uh, what Syed actually calls this is an analysis of the text's surface or exteriority. So he's looking at the text and the text can also be an image and text can also give out um, you know an idea of the other um, and you know and what is also is an analysis of what lies hidden in the text. So one is what the text is telling you, the exteriority and the other thing is what the text is not telling you or is, is sort of hidden. It's um, you know um, it's, it's implicit versus explicit sort of a uh, debate. And um, you know in, in all of this, um, so remember so all of these examples translate into some sort of an image of the other. And um, you know so I looked at style you know uh, you know the style figure of speech setting narrative device, um, you know, how you create the binaries, how, um, you know, you create, uh, you know, um, us and others, we and they, that sort of a binary. And looked at style, figure, spe figure of speech, setting, narrative choices, and narrative devices. So this, in a way, um, you know, puts forward an idea that the creation of the other through images um, and these being the vehicles of creating that image, you know, whether it's journalistic stories, travel books, um, religious books, novels, poetry, etc., you know, creates the image of an other, um, particularly given the colonial context. So this also, um, you know, brings me to the question of, um, you know, colonialism and its relationship with, um, you know, understanding how we understand race. And, you know, race, the very idea of creation of uh, race has been a social construct. And what you see on the screen is, um, you know, um, a screenshot from a YouTube uh, video that is available on YouTube. And I welcome you all to go and take a look. Um, so the title of the video is this, Race, Are We So Different? And it is a documentary put forward by the American Anthropological Association um, to answer questions of race um, and how the idea of race has evolved over um, decades, over the centuries. And the very fact that an idea that has evolved has to be a social construct. So they talk about the show um, in the documentary that, um, you know, uh, before race was even a social category in society, in, um, in American or European society, um, social stratification was based on um, social status. And that social status was linked not with how we understand race, but it was, um, you know, linked with um, uh, wealth. It was linked with, um, for example, um, power that was attached to um, owning sugar um, fields, etc., sugar plantations. Um, so, you know, the idea of social stratification changed over the decades and race um, as a social construct was introduced into um, the European and American societies um, at a particular historical juncture. So you would know once you view this um, you know, documentary, you would know, um, you know at what particular juncture race um, you know, takes over. But the point here is that um, you know, race being a social construct. If you look at, actually, if you look at the um, history of the U.S. Census, um, and if you look at the census form of um, the U.S., um, right from where, when it started till today, you will see that the categories of race have changed in the U.S. Census form. So what it started with something, you know, evolved into something and is very different uh, that we see today. So something, uh, you know, a category, a social category that evolves over time and that evolves through space, um, you know, is 
obviously a social construct. If it is not a social construct, you know, it would not be leaving any space for fluidity or adapting to changes um, or boundary transgression. So it is, um, you know, it is, you know, reinforcing the fact that race is a social construct and that in this regard of creating the other through images, um, you know, race, the idea of social construct, um, you know, plays a vital role. I will deal with this idea a little more in my lecture on images and intersectionality, but for here, um, you know, for the, the purpose of understanding, um, you need to be uh, familiar with this idea of race and social construct. So, what we are also looking at here then is uh, the idea um, of, um, you know, why do we need to create an other, you know? Why is it, um, you know, required that, you know, we create these powerful images? Why is it important that we, you know, have discourses around creation of the other? Um, and, uh, you know, one of the purposes uh, of creation of the other is to usher in the idea of modernity or modernities. So, I am talking about both singular and plural forms of um, the idea of modernity. And we see that the creation of the other, you know, once you are able to separate um, yourself from the rest. Um, you know, once you have created achieving um, that boundary work, then it is also becoming easier for yourself to situate yourself in a cultural context that, you know, this is we, this is they, this is um, us, this is others, right? So, we do see that the idea of modernity that grew and spread through the processes of colonialism they become integral to the nation state system that emerge. So, if you look at the history of nation, the birth of nation state system, you know, you know, uh, for example, uh, in the Indian context, if you look at the, um, you know, the history of, um, um, you know, freedom movement in India um, or in South Asia by extension, um, that, you know, you see the idea of modernity that is being ushered in um, as a reaction to the processes of colonialism and, um, you know, the emergence of nation state uh, system. So, I mean, I am talking about clear boundaries here, I am talking about boundary work here, um, you know, and any form of boundary, uh, you know, that would be meaningful in this context, whether it is political, whether it is geographical, whether it is social, um, you know, whatever is the, so whether it is symbolic, you know, whatever is the form of um, the boundary. Um, the idea of creating the other, you know, powerful images of the other, um, it also brings, um, you know, with it a narrative of progress that you need to separate yourself from the other, um, you need to break yourself possibly a break from an irrational tradition in which subjects always overcome and surpass that which came before. So, modernity, the idea of modernity and the creation of the other, um, you know, um, in, in that process is also creating a narrative of progress. And, and we do see that, you know, creating this other in various forms, in, you know, a variety of forms um, is put into effect through, um, you know, science and management projects, development of new social institutions like prisons, hospitals, factories, schools and new ways of organizing people. So, you know, the narrative of progress that it brings with it, uh, you know, is is one of the fundamental purposes, one of the fundamental purposes of, uh, you know, imaging and imagining the other. So, um, just to look at, um, uh, you know, uh, a significant um, critical theorist um, uh, who has uh, shed important light on the nature and use of colonizers' knowledge, um, you know, about the colonized. Um, if we look at, uh, you know, the idea of 
um, you know discourse of knowledge that uh, you know the discourse of knowledge uh, where there is always um, us and them um, it is not no neither of these pronouns you know neither of us and them they are standing consistently on any one side of a permanent divide so the boundary work here is not a permanent divide the boundary work is not a permanent boundary and neither are the categories of us and them neither are the categories of um, you know us and others so um, when when the, the when the category of the other is created um, you know that creation of the other is a product of that cultural historical moment and that that other is also a very fluid concept so us and them if you deal with these two categories for example um, you know they change their shapes with the you know expulsion and ingestion of all sorts of constellation of people and you know we do see that these categories evolve and uh, you know the ways that we in which these categories evolve um, you know have to do with the changing nature of the constellation of people and um, also with the changing nature of interpretation distribution of images amongst themselves and beyond so you know how we construct these images how we construct the images of us and them you know us and others um, you know forms a, a, a sort of a knowledge base which is stable for that historical moment but it is also fluid and it's varied across time and space so this is coming from Foucault's ideas of looking at the nature and use of the colonizers knowledge about uh, the colonized now what is happening in the process is that um, you know if you are creating and recreating an image in the process if you are um, you know creating the other um, through an image and then recreating another uh, you know image depicting the other um, you know in the process the, you know the spectator or, or the photographer you know becomes sort of a hybrid component um, so uh, what is happening is that the hybrid photographer and this is from um, Sontag's um, idea um, and also you know Crosha and Uri's ideas that the hybrid photographer deploys particular aesthetics that excludes as much as it includes and that's important it is for example very unusual to see postcards or tourist photographs of landscapes of waste disease poverty sewage and despoilation and the photographer is a powerful hybrid whose outputs can produce a dominant set of visual images of say the orient for example while concealing the way that its character is needed to be constructed so you know second part of the quote is all the more important for us in this context is that you know we are acknowledging that we are dealing with fluid concepts here we are dealing with boundary work but we are also dealing with a level of fluidity in that boundary work and you know the way we construct images based on that boundary work um, you know the the photographer for example if we are talking of, of an image if you're talking of a photograph um, you know the photographer who is actually deciding that this is my frame this is my image is a powerful hybrid of you know those outputs is a powerful hybrid and um, you know what is being produced is that uh, a dominant set of visual images in um, in this case for orientalism 
while concealing the way that its character is needed to be constructed. So, there is again an implicit and explicit component of the image of the other and um, you know a lot of it actually depends on the photographer. A lot of it um, actually um, relates to how the photographer is a construct of um, his, you know her or his social reality. And so it is important again um, you know going back to uh, my lecture on um, the evolution of visual culture that the relationship between the viewer and the viewed you know the idea of spectatorship as well as the idea of the photographer uh, you know the image maker for example is of utmost importance. Um, so, um, what we are looking at here is that I go back to the image of um, Edward Said's book cover. What we are looking at here is that you know an image um, we are also communicating culture. We are also um, you know by looking at an image we are also sort of uh, using it as a vehicle to communicate cultural practices, cultural principles, cultural attributes, cultural assumptions um, and uh, you know in the process we are creating um, a discourse of the other. We are creating uh, you know what we understand to be a discourse um, of the other. So, I want to conclude um, my lecture um, by bringing you back to the ideas of um, what is the goal of then um, you know looking at an image uh, particularly in the form of creating an other. Um, and you know I want to push again you to think um, you know what sort of scientific inquiry are we you know um, aiming for um, when we look at uh, you know producing um, any of these um, um, forms of knowledge production. Um, so, uh, just to um, you know wrap up with um, you know what I have been talking about and, and you know a fact that I opened this lecture with um, the role of orientalism in defining Europe. Um, we do see that there are um, you know um, you know contrast conceptions and also questions of superiority and inferiority um, that uh, you know when, when we talk of orientalism uh, you know we see that it is the source of one's of one of Europe's deepest and most recurring images of the other. That you know you take the concept of orientalism and uh, you know the other becomes one of uh, you know Europe's uh, colonial Europe's uh, you know deepest and most recurring images. And in the process it has helped to, de to define Europe or how we understand the West as its contrasting image, idea, personality and experience. So, um, if you look at an image you know whether it is uh, you know in materiality or um, philosophically speaking um, you know whether you are looking at an image or idea or experience and you know you are trying to bring in this binary. Um, you know it is it is important to look at this uh, dynamism that is ingrained in this uh, binary. So, European culture gained it in strength and identity by setting itself off against the orient as a sort of surrogate and even underground self. So, it was important for Europe to create the other um, not just for creating the other, but also to redefine itself. And this is what the contrast per the conception um, of orientalism is bringing to the table of creating the image of the other. The second idea that uh, it is bringing to is um, the idea of superiority and inferiority. Uh, that those in the west saw themselves not just as different but as superior, 
in comparison to all non-European peoples and cultures. So, you know, coming back to Gramsci's idea of hegemony, uh, you know, it was an assumed form of an hegemonic um, order, um, and it was accepted by consent as conventional wisdom or common sense. And so, the idea of this hierarchical pattern, this is assumed form of hegemony, uh, you know, was also ushered in, was also a requirement um, for creating the concept of the image of the other. Now, um, in conclusion, so um, this has evolved uh, into uh, the idea of creation of the other has evolved into how we, um, you know, and, and the idea of assumed hegemony um, has evolved into a school of thought that we are familiar with the subaltern studies. And this is a conceptual framework again um, that, uh, you know, you may find helpful in understanding images um, of the other. Um, and, you know, if you are familiar with the history of subaltern studies, it originally um, was a term applied to subordinates in military hierarchies. And, um, and you know, it's coming from Gramsci's um, prison diaries, um, writings about hegemony. Um, and the subaltern studies group later picked up uh, the term from Gramsci's uh, idea in order to locate and reestablish a voice or collective agency in post-colonial India. And um, you know, and this is particularly for those who denied, who were denied access to representation by colonialism. So, the creation of the other, um, you know, was uh, was for an for a particular agenda, and then um, you know the subaltern groups, uh, you know, it, it comes as a critique of that, um, and you know, it, it picked up this topic of um, lending or establishing a voice um, uh, or a collective agency for create for the uh, you know quote unquote other, and then um, if you are familiar with guys Richard Chakravarti Spivak's work on the subaltern studies, um, if not, I. I uh, welcome you to please go ahead and take a look at her work. Um, that, um, you know, very powerful article that she wrote, Can the Subaltern Speak? So she's actually arguing that the efforts to uh, give collective voice to the subaltern group um, inevitably run into the problem of creating dependence upon intellectuals to speak for the subaltern condition rather than allowing them to speak for themselves. So the problem of, you know, uh, voicing the other still remains. The nature of the problem sort of probably has changed, um, but the, uh, you know, the idea of the other um, may have morphed into something different. So in the end, um, uh, I want to conclude with this idea of um, an epistemological turn, the idea of epistemology and why, you know, we need to talk about conceptualizing, um, imagining, uh, you know, uh, the other, why we need to critically reflect on that. Um, and I want to, um, you know, end with uh, Walter Benjamin's uh, quote that, um, you know, no poem is intended for the reader, no picture for the beholder, no symphony for the listener. And you know, what Benjamin is probably trying to do here is to get to the bottom of the epistemological questions of, you know, what is that image or art form um, doing in conceptions of what is knowledge, in conceptions of what is science, in conceptions of how we come to know things. So the questions of knowledge production and power negotiation and the relationship between the viewer and the viewed um, remains vital, remains fundamental, and at the very center of the relationship between um, creating an image and imagining the other. Thank you.